God is the God of hope. He's a God of restoration. And his arms are open wide for you to experience all that he is today. If God did it then, our God can do it again now. You may think it's over. Others may say it's over. But with our lives in God's hands, it is not over. The love of Jesus liberates our souls, steadies our feet, and gives us a hope that can never be taken away. Good morning, Faith. We miss you. Guess what? It's our favorite time of the week once again. Come on. Psalm 107 says, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. We've been redeemed today, church. Come on. If you need to get off your couch, sing a little bit, put your hands together, let's sing together. He led me out of the desert, brought me into his stream, river of living water. He turned my bitter into sweet, and all my burdens are lifted. You took these shackles off my feet. Oh, there's no sound louder than a captive set free. So we say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of His promises in my soul there's a life worth living cause he calls me his own and there's a hallelujah after sweet victory oh there's no sound louder than a captive set free we say there's no sound louder than a captive set free so we say let the redeemed of the Lord Say so, sing of His promises together sing you are my deliverer the freedom i'm living in you are my deliverer you are my promised land you are my deliverer the freedom i'm living in you are my deliverer you are my promised land let the redeemed of the lord say so sing of his promises Somebody celebrate today. We've been redeemed today. Set free in Jesus' name. And pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow. Let the redeemed of the Lord 
Say, come on, pour out your thankfulness. Pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow. Let the redeemed of the Come on, let's sing that once more. Sing. Oh, pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow. Let the redeemed of the Lord say. So thankful, Jesus. We serve a good God today. No matter the circumstances, our God is still on the throne. Still a good God. Still a loving God. Let's sing it together, sing. Amazing love. That welcomes me, the kindness of mercy that bought with blood and wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. So we sing, God, your soul.
of God is a non-negotiable. His nature doesn't shift or change. And God wants you to know that today. Regardless of what you're facing, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of even some of the mistakes you've made and now you're on the other side and you're trying to deal with maybe your own mistakes, you need to know something today. The God that you call your God and you've given your life to Him, He is good. In suffering, he is good. In pain, he is good. In difficulties, he is good. And it's the goodness of God that works its way into our life, into your mind. The goodness of God is what allows you to have freedom from addiction because of his goodness. He wants to set you free. The work of Jesus has allowed you to experience all of God's goodness. We find when Jesus was crucified, it said that the veil that was in the temple that separated the normal people from the special people, the priests, was torn from bottom to top in half. When Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. What that means is, is you are no longer, if you are in Christ, you are no longer, you are no longer subject to that which was. You are a new creation. It means when Jesus cried out, he made a way for everybody to come into the presence of God. He made a way for everyone to experience God's goodness. And what do you need today? Is it the goodness of provision? God has it for you. Is the goodness of healing? God has it for you. Is it the goodness of deliverance from demonic spirits in the name of Jesus? God has it for you today. Is it the goodness of peace? It's yours today. Is it the goodness of hope? It's yours today because of Jesus Christ. Our God is so good. And I want you to receive that today. I want you to receive the goodness of God. Please hear my heart. 
as your pastor, my number one goal and heart every time I stand up here is that somehow I could use measly words to remind you of God's love for you, his hope for you, his goodness towards you, his care for you, the promises in his word for you. That's my job. Your job is to believe what's in the word. Your job is to receive that in Jesus' name today. Our God is good, and you need to know that. He's good. I know you might be thinking, yeah, but Jason, I don't know if God's, no, no, no. He's good, period. That's it. He doesn't have any other corners to him. Doesn't have any other rooms. His, his whole room is good. That's it. There's no other doors that lead to, he is good all the time. And so we come and we worship him. And we, we celebrate his goodness. And in response to that, out of our songs of worship, he responds to us and reveals more of his goodness. We also give financially to God because of his goodness. We give to God because he's given us everything. And every time you give financially to God, you're acknowledging God. I'm acknowledging everything that I have is yours. And when you give to God, it, cons- it consecrates, it sets aside everything that you have. In other words, now God can bless everything that you have. When you take the first step of responsibility and discipline and you give, all of a sudden things are given back to you. Let me encourage you today, if you've never given, we're about to give. If you've never given and you want to experience the goodness of God, I'm just telling you right now, this is a step in doing that and experience God's goodness. I want you to look at this promise out of Luke chapter 6. This is Jesus says this. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together. So I hope you can hear the language in there. He's talking about his goodness. As you give to him, he does something amazing in your life. Not only is it pressed down, shaken together, running over, it will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use or you give, it will be measured to you today. And the way that God laid out giving in Scripture is that your local body, your local church that God has called you to be a part of and a member to, that you would give regularly and faithful. And first off, I just want to thank you for doing that. I want to thank you for continuing to give. I want to thank you for continuing to defy fear and give in faith. And, for, and another thing, I want to hear some of these stories that, you, that I've heard in the grapevine, but I want to hear how God's provided for you as you've been faithful to give. But this is the key. As you give, then it will be pressed down. As you give, then it will run over in your lap. And so let me encourage you today. You can give by text, which is super easy. I've done that several times. You can give just by stopping stopping by the church office and dropping it off. Or you can give online. You can just click on the the, the little give button on on faith.church and you can give. Listen, I want you to experience everything that God has for you. And I want you to know that he's good. So let me pray for you today. Father, in Jesus' name. We take this time to worship you with our finances. We take this time to acknowledge everything I have in my life belongs to you. And I want you to bless everything in my life. So as an act of faith, as an act of discipline, as an act of spiritual maturity, I am giving today. $5, $10, $100, $1,000, the 10% of tithe or an offering above that, whatever that is, God. I'm giving today and I'm anchoring my life to your promise. That as I give, you reveal more of your goodness. As I worship, you reveal more of your goodness to me. Now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bless every person that's watching this right now. God, I bless them if, even if they're in lack today. God, I pray you bless them in Jesus' name. I pray that you would minister to them. I pray that you would open up doors. I pray that you would prosper them. I pray that they would get phone calls of jobs. I pray that you would provide. You would, you would make creative ways, God, for provision for them. I pray right now that you would remove all fear in Jesus' name. That they would know, God, you're good. And that, God, they would experience your provision that is always on time and enough. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship today.
this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the service today. We're so grateful that you're here. And I, I really, I just want to take a moment. I just want to just truly thank you for joining. Thank you for making this a priority in your life for us as a church. This, this moment, this time really matters. And if you're anything like probably my family, this time is attacked by every distraction that it, there is under the sun. 
And so that's why it's so important that we set this time aside and we're demonstrating to our families. We're also demonstrating to our flesh that doesn't always want to stop. We're going to stop. We're going to listen. We're going to, we're going to worship God. And we're going to experience his presence. We're going to listen to the word. We're going to apply this to our lives. And I just want to thank you for just being an awesome family as we go on this journey together. Also, I just want to welcome our family at Jeffco Jail. Listen, you're loved. You are, you are thought of often, and we're grateful for everything that God's doing in your life. And please know that you are loved. Please know that you are a part of our family, and so you matter a lot to us. And so, guys, listen, we're, we're on this journey of this very interesting situation of COVID-19. And just so you're aware, we are continuing and working on our re-entry process, and you're going to hear more about that the beginning of this week. And so I just want to thank you for your patience as we navigate what God's called us to do. And, you know, there was an email I sent out, and I I quoted a passage out of Hebrews in there where it talks about pastors, and it talks about their responsibility of care over the flock. And then it says this statement. It says, because they will give an account to God. And so please know all of our decisions are based off of what we sense God is speaking to us as we navigate your care and your protection is what's on our minds. Because when we stand before God, you won't be there. Um, No one else will be there. It'll be us as pastors giving an account for what we did. And so please know our hearts are making those decisions out of honoring your father and our father, but us being responsible in our role. So guys, listen, really excited about the series I'm launching today. And I've titled it Anchored. Because as, as I begin to look into storms of life, I thought, you know, it would be really great for us over the next several weeks to look at the promises of God. I, I hope you understand this. There are 7,000, someone counted, there's over 7,000 promises in the scripture. And no, I won't do a message on each one, but this is something that we're going to lean into. Because the promises of God are something that's so important for you to understand because in the journey, we can forget about them. In the journey, we can forget about the nature of God because so many times we allow circumstances to tell us what God is like. or We we allow emotions to tell us what God is like and those will fail us. I'm sure you felt something at some point or been in a conversation and, and you, said, you said to someone, well, I just feel that this is what's happening. And then once you look into it, you realize, oh, that wasn't what was happening at all because we can't trust our feelings. But I will say this, we can trust God and we can trust his promises. And so we're going to lean in to this, to this series and, and look at what does it mean to be anchored to the promises of God. And I titled this message, Seeing the Future, Seeing the Future Through God's Promises. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but you know, the cross that we see all the time actually was not the original symbol for Christianity. An anchor was the original symbol. During the period of the Roman persecution, when Christians were being murdered and tortured, the first century symbol of Christianity was an anchor. Is, is, think about this, as you're, as you're hiding in catacombs and your friends had been burned at the stake or eaten by lions or, or tortured, it's important to know that you have an anchor in your faith. And so many times where they, they, saw, they found that Christians would hide in these certain places, guess what symbol they would put on the wall? It was an anchor. It was to remind them that God is their anchor in all storms. And they go over the time we've, we've probably taken the cross and made it a religious thing and, and made it something that, that we have anchored our life to. But you need to understand something. Yes, we get the cross. Yes, it's the work of Jesus. Absolutely. But to the early Christians, the cross was a symbol of death. What they thought about was the resurrection and the power of Jesus Christ. And that if they could anchor their life to his resurrection, that they were going to be okay. That they were going to make it. And so here we are looking at the anchors, looking at God is our anchor. And these anchors are the promises of God. What I love as you look into study um, the anchor, you will find that the anchor many times was placed on tombstones of believers. 
It was a symbol of Christianity shortly after the resurrection of Jesus. And along with the anchor would be some statement about Jesus, some statement about the faithfulness of God, some statement from Scripture about who God is. And so the passage of this series comes from Hebrews chapter 6. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. This hope is all the promises of God. This hope is the work of Jesus Christ that was done for you. So I know that there are still many unknowns. As we look to the future, there are unknowns. And the enemy can come in and cause fear. He can cause loss of hope, loss of worry. When we begin to just take in all the information that's constantly being propelled at our, at our minds. But hear me today. God has not left us without help or without hope. He has not left you. You may feel that way. You may think, where is God in all of this? How come God isn't intervening? How come God isn't is it doing this? How come God isn't doing that? Listen, he has not left us without help or without hope. Now, in a real practical sense, what this means is this. God is never surprised in difficult situations. Pastor Jim, one of our pastors, he often says this when we're facing difficulty. He says, first off, um, God was fully aware about the situation. This did not surprise God. It's so important that you understand that. God never goes, wow, where did this come from? He never says, oh no, what am I going to do? No, because he is God. He sees the beginning from the end. God knows everything. Think about this. He knows everything that's ever going to happen. He knows it. He knows everything that you're ever going to say. God knows every thought you're going to ever think. God knows everything you're going to do in your life already. He knows your good choices and your bad choices. And there is nothing that you are going to do that he doesn't already know. He already knows the end of your life. But we can make decisions within this span of life. Also, this is what scripture says out of Hebrews chapter 4. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes. There's something I want you to anchor your life to today. And I'm really excited because every week we're going to think of a promise. We're going to look at the promises that are going to anchor us. But today it's about your future. God's plan for your future. You need to hear me. It is good. It's not bad. In fact, God has no, think about it, he has no bad plans for those who are serving him. None. God is a good God. And because he is good, all of his plans are good. He doesn't have, again, any bad plans for you. All of his plans are good. Jeremiah 29, 11, this is God speaking to the children of Israel. And at, then in Christ, all of those promises now belong to us. Says this, for I know the plans I have for you. I know them. You may not know them, but I know them because I see the beginning from the end. I know your future. You don't know your future. I do. Declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. In this statement is, is God addressing hu humanity's mind that thinks they know God's plan and God must not be good. God must not care about me. God must not care. No, no. He says, no, hang, hang on, hang on. What, what are you talking about? I know the plans for you, and that's to prosper you. I'm not going to harm you. I'm going to give you a hope. I'm going to give you a future. I'm going to pave a way for you to choose that will give you those things in your life. That's your promise right there today. Think about that. Future plans to prosper, not to harm you. He wants to give you a hope. This says that God has some amazing things for you in your future. Listen, we, do, we are facing some unknowns about the future. How's everything going to come back together? How, what's our economy going to be like? What, how, how, how long is this going to go on? Or is, is, will this try to come back again? But listen to me, for your personal life, if you will cooperate with God, He will do things in your life you never thought possible. If you will cooperate with God, He's thought about every detail. He's thought, he's thought about every part of it. He has a plan for your life. His plan is good. Your future is good if you cooperate with God. His plans to prosper you, give you a future. Now, here's the question. Can you miss God's 
plan and will. Yes, you can. You absolutely can. I'd say probably most of us miss God's plan and will sometime and somewhere in our lives. But God is a God who can restore you back into his plan and to his will as, as, as we cooperate with him. But most people miss God's plan because this is what they do. Let me tell you. This is it. Hear me. They miss God's plan because they choose their own plan. They go their own way. They do their own thing. One of, one of the greatest gifts that we have, but is also a hindrance for us, is the freedom to choose. You can choose God's way, or you can choose your way. God could have made us where we didn't have a choice, but, but that would not be relational. Where you couldn't choose bad or make bad decisions. You couldn't choose to do other things. But he made you in his image. And, and God himself has a choice. That means he gave us a free will because he has a free will. And every day you can make choices. And there's one way that keeps us from following God's way. And I'll tell you what it is. It's our pride. Pride keeps people from fulfilling the purpose of God. Because our pride maybe, maybe sounds like this. I, I know that God has a plan for my life. Yes, I know that, but, but actually, I think I know how to get there quicker than he does. Yes, I know God has amazing things for me, but I think I know what the best way is for me to get there. Yes, I know God has provision for me, but I think I know how to get that provision outside of what he said. I know God has a relationship for me, but I think I know what I need before actually what he, he knows that I need. And so that's called pride. It's also called, as a, a follower of Jesus, it's called disobedience. But when you anchor your life to his, his promises, his word, his voice, listen to me, you won't miss God's will and God's future for you. Deuteronomy 30 says this, I have set before you life and death. So listen, this series is about us choosing God's promise over our own, over what we think we need, over our own feelings, over our emotions. This is what this series is about. Anchoring our life to God's word and God's promise, not to the storm around us, because you can choose either life or death. You can also choose blessing or you can choose curse, cursing. This is what God says. I want you to choose life. I want you to choose life so that you and your children may live. Listen, think about that. God has given you a choice. And he says, listen, you can choose my way, which is blessings and life, or you can choose your way, which is cursing and death. He's saying the choice that you make, not only will it affect you, now hear me today, it will affect generations to come. The blessing that God wants to put on your life is actually the blessing. The blessing of your obedience from God actually will affect generations to come. Not only your choices that affect others, but it also affects others coming to Jesus Christ. As you cooperate with God, as you come into alignment with His promises, with His kingdom, with His purpose, you are then filled with His love, His life, when life is crazy, guess what? You're not, because you're, you're anchored to the promise. When storms rage, guess what? You have an anchor. When you look to the future, instead of being filled with fear, you are filled with expectation, peace, and hope. Because, listen, my God's good, and I'm anchored to his promise. I'm anchored to him. The world doesn't dictate my future. My God dictates my future. And so I want to give you today just four things that will help us if we are anchored to God's promises for the future. Four principles of staying anchored to God's promises for your future. Number one, staying anchored to God's promises, it will guide you in confusing times. We are in confusing times. But being anchored to God's promise will guide you. Listen, the truth is this. Your future is going to require a lot of decisions. 
Your future is going to require you to actually make decisions on what you're going to do. Are you going to go back to hanging with friends you used to? Are you going to go back to maybe gossiping because you haven't because you've been quarantined? Are you going to go back to patterns of life that, that weren't healthy for you? Are you going to go back to old ways of thinking? You're going to have to make a lot of choices. And some of those choices are gonna be difficult. And some of those choices are gonna be confusing and you're gonna need the clarity of God. When we get confused because of scary decisions like should I go to this college? Should I take this new job? What should I do? We get confused and what happens? We get trapped and stuck in our confusion. You don't have to be stuck in confusion anymore. You don't have to be stuck. You can anchor your life to the promises of God. And in confusion, And the reason why I know this, because I've been there, in confusion, we get desperate and start trying to get direction by talking to friends. One time, just as as something to mess around with, I thought, I wonder if I can get a prophetic word online. I don't know if you've ever done anything like that. So what you do when you're not trusting God, um, you Google it. So I Google it. And I started looking. And so I found a website where you could pay just a measly $25 and get a prophetic word. I didn't do it. It was just funny. That's what happened. You start, you get desperate. God, you're not talking to me. So I'm going to find somebody that's going to talk to me. You start talking to friends. You start watching the news. You start listening to your feelings. But those things and those people, let, hear me, they don't know the future. God does. There's only one authority that knows the beginning from the end. There's only one authority that's always right. There's only one authority that's always working on your behalf. That's always completely and totally reliable. And guess who that is? That is your God that has called you to be his son and his daughter. You can rely on him. You can bet on that horse because he's going to win every time. He's the one that you anchor your life to. So we anchor to his promises. When the world is uncertain about everything that's going on, guess what? About the, when the world's uncertain about the future, I'm not. I'm not. I may not know the details of the future, but here's, here's the truth. Why do I have to? Because God does. So many times, many times we, we hold our obedience hostage till God tells us the details. Wait, hang on, hang on, God. I, I'll obey you, but you need to tell me what's going to happen. He's like, no, 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 how about this? You obey me, and then I'll demonstrate to you my faithfulness. That's called trust. You know, we have the, the, the book that's called The Five Love Languages. And it, you know, it goes through all the five love languages for relationships. One time I was praying and just seeking the Lord, and, and I just had this thought just as I talked to him because he's my father and he cares for me. I said, Lord, what's your love language? What makes you feel loved by me? And he said, when you trust me without knowing the details. The Lord spoke that to me and I thought, wow, that, makes a, that, con, that, is, that is confirmed in Scripture that it's faith that pleases God. It's faith. You don't need to know the future. You just need to know that God does and that you can rest in that. God is the one that you're following, not human beings. Look at Proverbs chapter 3. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart. So there's this trust word. Put your faith in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. We we got a lot of leaning on understandings right now. No, 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 don't lean on that. Now remember, we're looking at this for your future. So, So trust in the Lord with all your heart for your future. And lean not on your understanding for your future. And all your ways submit to him. And he will make your path straight. He will direct your steps. How? How's he going to do that? When we don't lean on our understanding and we submit to him. When we submit to him. This is the benefit. When you anchor your life to God's promises... For the future, he will guide you. He will guide you. And he will not abandon you. Another benefit of anchoring your your life to the promises of God. Number two, it will help you to overcome temptation. This is the big one right now. Because as all life's changing, we maybe have more time on our hands. Maybe you're returning to old patterns of sin that you thought the Lord had 
uh, had set you free from, and he did, but we just are returning and making choices again. It's about our choices that we make. And one thing that's not going to change in your future that we're talking about today is the reality you're going to keep getting tempted, just so you know. Temptation's never going to go away until you get to heaven. And I've learned this in my own life. The more mature that I get, the more I grow in, in my relationship with God and in maturity, the more Satan tempts me. And this is what I believe. Satan doesn't bother with you if you're not doing anything. If God's hand isn't on your life, if God doesn't have plans for you, he, he's not worried about you. So if you are facing incredible temptation, it's the enemy trying to cut in because God's got something amazing for you. You can make a difference with your life. And if you can, he's going to really go after you. Some of the temptations in your life, as the more, the more mature you get, the more tempted you will get. You're just, here's the deal. Temptation may increase. You're just going to be more equipped to deal with them. You're going to know how to deal with it. It doesn't mean the temptations go away as a believer. It just means that you don't give in to them anymore. And anchoring yourself to God's promise will help you overcome temptation. Now, here's the truth. Some of you are carrying false, false shame because you think, you know what, I shouldn't be tempted anymore. I thought I was past this. I thought I was, I was more mature than this. I shouldn't be having this thought right now. I shouldn't be feeling this way. But here's, here's the, that's just not true. You need to know this. You are not responsible for every thought that comes to your mind, okay? You're not responsible for that. You are, you are responsible for what you do with that thought. That is the choice. You can have all kinds of thoughts. You're like, where'd that thought come from? Oh my gosh. Why? No, how you respond to that thought. One, is what produces more maturity. Or two, takes you down a road of sin. When Satan gives you an idea, puts it in your mind, that's called a temptation. When God gives you an idea... And he suggests something in your mind, and that, and that idea is confirmed in the Word. That's called inspiration from God. So here we have different thoughts that come to us. Some are temptations, others are inspiration, and then there's your own thoughts that you have to deal with. And so if you're like, you know, but I, 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 think, I think this way and I'm just feeling this way. Those are our thoughts. Some could be true, some could not be true. But the reality is you need to learn to separate them. Some people confuse their thoughts with God's thoughts. I see that all the time. People say, well, I think this is what's happening. This must be God revealing to me. Then later you realize that, had, that was your own thoughts, your own what's called vain imagination. Make stuff up. But here's the truth. Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every, as, in every point as we were tempted. But he never sinned. Temptation is an opportunity to make a choice. That's what it is. The reason you're tempted is because, let, let me hear you. The re, let, I want you to hear me. The reason why you're tempted, you, you ready for this? It's because you're human. That's why. So you're going to be tempted. And every time you choose, listen to me, to do the right thing. Every time you, you crucify your flesh, you grow. Every time you choose and make a decision based off of the fruit of the Spirit that we talked about last week, we base it off of the principles of the Word, what happens is you grow, you become more mature. When you choose to do the wrong thing, when you choose to stumble, you fail, you go back. Temptation, hear me, temptation is your opportunity to grow. It's your opportunity to strengthen yourself by the grace of God. So don't be ashamed by a thought in your head. See that as an opportunity to grow. You can't control having negative thoughts. You know, negative thoughts about people, situations, church, small groups, that's not a sin. Or the people in your church, or the people, that's not a sin. Acting on those and gossiping about that causing others to doubt other people or even in your own family, that is a sin because you've acted on it. You've responded to it. If you're speaking negatively, which is, seems to be a bit of an epidemic right now, what I know in, in the world but also in the church, speaking negatively and fatalistically towards situations, 
that you aren't a part of and don't have all the information. You know what that's called? It's called gossip. And God wants us to be better than this. He wants us to resist that temptation. Gossip is a sin. And speaking positively, now think about this, speaking positively about situations and people that you don't have all the information about, you know what that's called? It's called believing the best. That's called controlling your thoughts. That's called, that's called not giving into temptation. You can either speak like you know something and c- come up with a judgment, or you can say, I don't know all the details. I'm going to just believe the best. One brings life. The other brings death. There's other th- also thoughts, sinful thoughts, lustful thoughts. You can't control, hear me, you can't control what gets your attention, but you can control what keeps it. You can't control what gets your attention, but you can control what keeps it. That's your choice. And God has given you the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to resist sin. And he's also given you the grace that when you fall, that he will pick you back up again, that the righteous may fall but they get up and keep going. But this is our opportunity. For all of us, there are, there are lustful thoughts that come in all of our minds. It could be a heterosexual temptation. It could be a homosexual temptation. And you go, you know, I'm not supposed to have this. I'm a Christian. You need to, you need to understand that. It's not the attraction That is the sin. It's the action. It's not a sin for what attracts you. It's it's our actions towards that attraction is what the sin is. Anchor yourself to this promise out of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. This is the promise that's going to help you prosper in the future. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. So you're thinking today, man, nobody else is having these temptations. Yes, they are. They absolutely are. As God is faithful, here's that word, faithful, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, now here's your promise, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You have a promise. There is always an escape. God is faithful. He is our anchor. Anchor yourself to that. When you're tempted, anchor yourself to the truth that God is faithful. He's going to sustain you through this. If it's anxiety, God is faithful. If it's anger, God is faithful. If it's lust, God is, th- God is faithful. If it's substance abuse, God is faithful. If it's fear, God is faithful. If it's materialism, God is faithful. If it's gossip, God is faithful. When you're tempted, listen, God will give you and show you a way out if you're looking for it. It's comforting to know that God understands your struggles. He knows exactly what you're going through. He is with you. He is for you. Jesus experienced the same temptations. He is prepared. He has prepared an escape route. If you anchor yourself to that promise, you're going to take it. There are going to be times, though, that you're not. There's going to be times that you're going to give in. Again, hear me today. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ extends his hand to you and says, come on, son. Come on, daughter. Let's keep moving forward. That's the promise that he will make a way. The other promise, he is faithful to meet you. When you are faithless, he is faithful. Number three, anchoring yourself to the promises of God for the future will steady you in trouble. Temptation is a storm on the inside, and we've all faced it. But this is about storm on the outside. This is about difficulties in life. And so in life, for the rest of your life, because we live in a broken planet, you're going to have temptations and trouble, internal temptations and external trouble. Jesus said in the world, he promised, you're going to have trouble. Well, that's what we're in right now. We're having some troubles. There's all kinds of troubles, though. There's relational trouble. Which, yeah, we go through. Financial trouble, physical trouble. There's mental trouble. There's different trials and troubles of tribulations in life. Some people expect life to be heaven on earth. I wish that was true. If you don't know this, I want you to hear my heart today. This will maybe help set some right expectations. 
This is not heaven. It's not heaven. The greatest thing you can do to help you deal with life is to acknowledge this is not heaven. It is in heaven that we will be one day. There's no sorrow. There's no suffering. There's no sickness. There's no sadness. There's no trials. There's no tears. There's nothing going to be wrong in heaven. It's all great there. But this is earth. And God has given you as his child promises promises that are going to anchor you in every storm, in every trouble, in every uncertainty, in every confusing situation. He's going to anchor you and you are going to be sustained by his promises. We will have trouble. And in trouble, we can sit around. We, we do have a couple options. We can sit around and talk about how troubling everything is, or we can focus on the promises of God in the midst of trouble. Yes, this is painful, but man, my God is good. He promised he's going to sustain me. My God is good. He's promised to be with me. And the more you focus, now here's the key. The more you focus on God's promises, the more your faith grows. And here's the deal. The more miracles you're going to receive and you're going to see. That's just the way God works. All the great men and the great women of the Bible that experienced miracles, were believing God and trusting in his promises while they were going through difficult trouble. But God, God moved in their behalf. I want you to anchor your life to God's promises and to know that in the midst of trouble that your God is with you. You will be sustained by God. I want to remind you out of Joshua chapter 1 says this. Be strong and create courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. I want you to receive that today. Your God is with you wherever you go. Isaiah 41 says this. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. My friend, you've got a friend. And his name is Jesus, and he's with you. Matthew 28 says this, I am with you always to the ends of the age. And this is Jesus was speaking to his disciples that he knew would be going through trouble. First Thessalonians says this, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Praise God. My friends, anchor your life to God's promises and let them propel you into the future. Your faith is precious. And let me encourage you, protect your faith. Protect it. Protect it like it's something that, that you need to cultivate and feed because it's true. So you can anchor your life to God's promises. Cheryl and I, in our personal lives, something for us that's very important, we purposely surround ourselves with people who are focused on faith and God's promises. We just do that in our own personal life, in our close relationships. And we purposely stay away from people who speak death, negativity, and focus on what's wrong or what could go wrong. I, I don't need that in my life. I want to be around people that are, that are leaning into God, that are believing God for breakthrough. We see the trouble. When we face situations where I don't say it's not there, I'm going to hide. I don't hide my head in the sand. I see it. I acknowledge it. I know it's there. And we do our best to fix whatever trouble that we're facing and what God has called us and gifted us to do in our own lives. But we don't put our faith in the trouble. The trouble doesn't determine my future. The issues don't determine my future. We put our faith in the promises of God. And that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Because the Bible says it, it's faith that pleases God. It's belief that he's good that pleases God. It's, it is, it's the, when it's impossible, I put my faith in God. And God says, the word says, when it is possible, when it's impossible, with God it is possible. So that's why I'm going to lean into God, not my trouble. And the Bible says it's, it's impossible to please God without faith. And here's the truth. As I've been navigating where we are and 
with my team and everything. The fact is this, you don't need as much faith when you don't have trouble. You just don't. If it's just life is just awesome all the time, your roots go really shallow. And so the slightest little wind, it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow you over. But it's in the troubled times that God calls us to double down and anchor our lives to his promises and to fix our eyes on him. And if you do this, my friend, you're going to be steady and you're going to see miracles. As being in God's family, listen, you have an inheritance in and through Jesus Christ. All the promises of God. But here's the other piece. Being in his family, you also have a responsibility And those responsibilities are connected to his promises. And so let me just encourage you. Walk in your responsibility as a believer. Through this season here at Faith, we've we've pressed in. Yes, we've been navigating and and shaping all of that. And I'm believing all of this is going to be sorted out in the next couple weeks. But we've pressed in. We've prayed. We've fasted. God is birthing, though, in the midst of trouble, he starts to birth a new vision and new responsibilities for what God's calling this church to be and to do. God's expanding our vision to reach more people, to serve more people, to train and equip more ministry leaders to be laborers in the field of harvest that I believe with every bone in my body, it's coming. And Jesus said, Don't pray for the harvest, pray for the laborers. We have a responsibility, and so we're leaning in in the midst of trouble to think about how we can expand the ministry. We're going to, in the name of Jesus, what we believe God's called us, we're going to plant churches. We're going to call people to be pastors and missionaries, teachers of the word. And at the same time, at the same time actually now that people are limiting their vision, by fear they're stepping back. We have made a decision to focus on God's heart, God's promises, and our responsibility for the future. And he has expanded the vision for this ministry because he has a great vision for the future. God's promises for you are to steady you in trouble and to give you clarity when everyone else is freaking out. So as God gives you new things in the midst of troubles and steadies you, remember this out of Philippians 4, which is your promise to anchor to. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things. All things. And the last point is this. Being anchored to God's promises, number four, will cause you to be blessed. It will cause you to be blessed. Well, how, Jason? It's very easy, actually. Anchoring your life to God's promises means you're obeying God. You're serving and you're giving, which means because of God's promises, it unlocks God's blessing for your future. That's just the the, the way it is. God's promised to reward my service, to reward your service, to reward your giving, to reward your generosity. He promises to reward your desire and actions to become more like Christ as you depend on him. Jesus is this model, is the model to perfect humanity. And God wants us to grow and to strive, not in our own power, but by his grace leading us and empowering us to do so, to become like him. He wants us to think like Jesus Christ. He wants us to feel like Christ. He wants us to be like Jesus Christ, to serve like Christ, to be giving like Jesus Christ. God's culture. So God, the kingdom of God has a culture. And what is rewarded in God's culture is when we do what he does. When we come into alignment and cooperate with the will and the work of God. God is a giving and serving God. He's a loving and he's loving, he's serving, he's generous. And when you begin to model those things and, be serve, and serve and give and be generous and, and participate with sharing your faith and, and touching the world around you and the nations of the world, God blesses you. It's just what happens when you learn to give your life away, you learn to give your time away, and you learn to give money away, and you learn to be a, a life giver, not a life taker. When you, that's when you fully begin to live 
And then life takes on a new meaning, and all of a sudden, you become a conduit for the blessing and provision of God to flow through you. That's what will happen. God created us to live in His model, to serve, to reach other people, to be a part of a body that's giving and generous. And I'm so blessed by you. Your willingness to follow Jesus has ministered to me. It's ministered to this body. And I'm so proud of you. But God has more for us to do. God has a greater harvest for us. And it's going to take all of us to say yes to God. It's going to take all of us to say yes to giving our child up to be a missionary. To believing that our son can be a pastor. To, to, to investing into the body God's called you to be. To serve people. The Lord didn't call us to live a life and create us to live for ourselves. That's actually the absolute opposite of the life of Jesus. When you live like Jesus, he promises to bless your future. God promises all through his word that he rewards those who serve and who give. And he rewards it in a tremendous great way. Remember these promises. Hebrews chapter 6. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. Paul was writing this to church folks just like you. The next verse out of Philippians says this, and my God will meet, now listen, all of your needs according to the riches in his glory in Christ Jesus. These are for those who are choosing to live life the way that Jesus has called them to live. Second Corinthians says this, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. This, these are powerful. Another verse says this, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. This is good news, my friends. God wants to bless your future. And the future may seem uncertain, but as you come into cooperation with God's promises, as you run them over in your head, as you believe them, as you say, God, I don't feel like I believe it, but I'm going to speak this over my life. God begins to give you a new authority as you walk it out. Matthew chapter 6, listen to what Jesus says. Do not worry about the future. He was talking about the future. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans, in other words, those who don't know God, they worry about this stuff. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He already knows you need it. But seek first his kingdom. In other words, come into cooperation, into alignment with his principles and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. This is your promise. We're going to spend the next several weeks Remembering the promises of God, lifting our faith. God holds your future, my friends. He has, he has promises for you that are waiting for you to come into cooperation with. But today, I just want to ask you a few questions. Are you confused today? The decision you're making? Listen, God will guide you. His promises are there to guide you. Are you facing a temptation? Listen to me. In the name of Jesus, God will help you overcome are you in the midst of trouble? Listen, God will steady you and meet you in the midst of your trouble. Are you concerned about the future? God will bless you as you obey his word and walk out what he's called you to do. He's there to meet you. He's there to strengthen you. God has amazing things for your life, for your children, for generations. And we are going to pursue all that God has for us. And my heart for you is that you would achieve all that God has for you and your family. Let's take these next several weeks and let's anchor ourselves to the promises of God. And let's see God do miracles in our midst. Let me pray for you today. Father, I want to thank you for our families and our, our church family that's joining us. Whether it's in their homes, in their cars, 
a Jeffco jail. Lord, you have amazing promises for them. And in the name of Jesus, God, I ask you that you'd give us the faith today to anchor our lives to your promises. Areas of our life that we need to repent, Lord, we just repent. We say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And let us be restored back into walking in the call of God over our lives. Lord, I want to thank you for our church family. I want to thank you that you're moving in their homes. Lord, I'm praying for everyone today that is struggling, that is facing uncertain times, praying for fear and anxiety, must leave in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you would speak to them, you'd comfort them, you'd send the Holy Spirit to wherever they are, that they would begin to receive the full peace and the benefits of your promises in their life. Provide for them, make a way for them, heal their relationships, and lift their eyes to focus on your goodness, not the circumstances around. And we're going to see you move in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you are joining us and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, this is your moment. And let me just encourage you. The Bible says that if you put your trust in him, if you believe that he died on the cross for you and he rose from the dead and that he is there to forgive you of your sins and make you his child. If you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. If you want to give your life to Jesus today, this is your moment. This is why you've been watching this whole time. And I want you to pray with me. Repeat these words. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you rose from the dead and are alive. And I believe that you're drawing me to be your child. Please forgive me. Cleanse my heart. And with your help, I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, there's a number on the screen. And I want you to text that number. If you can't text the number and you, you want to write us a letter, write us a letter. But text SAVE to that number, and we will get you the instructions on what's next for you. Listen, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for all of you that are joining. And I'm thankful for what God's going to do in your life through his word and through this series. You will overcome, and we will see the provision of our God in our life because we're going to anchor our life to his promises. Not to the storms, but to his promises. Listen, stay tuned. At the, at the end of this message, in just a moment, you're going to hear an announcement. But also, just so you're aware, we're going to be communicating early this week, either tomorrow or the next day, regarding our reentry. Listen, I love you. God bless you. May you continue to anchor your life to his promises. God bless. We're so glad you joined us. Wasn't church amazing? Before you go, here are a few things to know. One, we recognize that while things are reopening and restrictions are lifting, people may still need a helping hand. Our Faith Cares initiative is still going strong, so if you need assistance, reach out to our hotline at 303-403-2715 or email faith.cares at faith.church. Two, now more than ever, it's so important to stay connected. You can use the handle at Faith Arvada to follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to us on YouTube. And of course, be sure to keep an eye on your inbox for important emails from us. Lastly, in case you missed the announcements before service started, please be on the lookout this week for more information regarding our plans for reentry. There's so much happening on a daily basis to make these plans and decisions. And be assured that our team is working really hard to consider all the complexities that come with this unique time in our lives. We so appreciate your patience, and we'll be sure to update you by email and on our social media feeds. And as always, know that you're loved and prayed for daily. And have a great week, Faith Family.